Auzu billahi min shaitan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Assalamu alaikum My name is Talay Ahmed and I've had the good fortune of working in MTA for the last several years and as part of the MTA team I've from time to time been able to join the crew that films various events at which Hazrat Khalif al-Masih is attending and for this reason I've been able to observe Hazur at close quarters and perhaps this is the reason why that Majlis al Dia asked me to say a few words about Hazur's blessed character for the virtual Atfal Rally 2020. One of the programs that I've had the honor of uh, contributing to, of being part of the team that works towards it, is This Week with Hazur. And that program launched in November 2018. And the first week went great, by the grace of Allah. But the second week, the second program that we made, I made a huge mistake. And that evening I came home, the program broadcast with the huge mistake as part of it. And I went to sleep and around midnight I received a text informing me that Hazur had seen the program and seen the mistake. And for this reason, the program needed to be removed from all social media. At the time I was asleep, so I read the message at around Fajr time. And of course I was devastated. Uh, one issue was that I, of course I had personally made an, such a big error that had broadcast an MTA, but even greater than that was the fact that Hazur was disappointed with me. And it was just a, a completely terrible feeling that I can't explain how uh, bad somebody feels when they know that it's in Hazur's knowledge that they've done something incorrect and that he, he's been disappointed. So I had these feelings and as, I, as was instructed, the program was removed from social media. And that evening I had a, an opportunity to attend the Mulukat at which Hazrat Khalif al Masih would be present. And at the time I was extremely nervous because I, I was wondered whether I should either attend, but I. I thought it's best that I do attend and I thought I'll hide at the back and then Hazu, uh, nobody will really notice me and I can just sit there in silence and at the end of the Mulukat uh, I, I, I'll leave with everyone else and uh, it'll pass like this. So I arrived at the Mulukat but when I arrived my expectations were completely reversed because Hazur came and he began to tell jokes and each time he would tell a joke he would turn towards me and he would say, Hana tale? Like, uh, don't you agree, Tale? And I, I would, and then he'd uh, start laughing and smiling with a big, broad smile. And I was completely shocked. I was so stunned I could barely reply, let alone think what was happening, because it was such a reversal of what my initial expectations would be, had been. Hazur's never been anything other than kind to me, but of course I thought that it, it would be very awkward, and yet Hazur was here being the absolute embodiment of forgiving and kind and loving. So that was uh, one occasion, but unfortunately, the mistakes that I made didn't end there. And uh, in the early development of the program, there were a number of occasions when things weren't uh, according to the level that they should have been. And so on one similar occasion, similarly, there was a mulukat that was going to happen and I thought I would hide behind the door, sort of the entrance door, and w would be able to listen to what was happening to the Malakat without uh, necessarily being involved. And at this time, th there had been such a run of errors within the work that I was producing that I was r really deeply, deeply sad. And I was wondering even whether I uh, would, people would require me to continue on this program because um, I thought, initially I thought when I'd made the first mistake that the program might even be cancelled, but instead Hazur had given guidance that we should continue and work harder. But at this point I thought, okay, the, the program will continue, but whether I'm asked to be part of the team that produces the program or not, that I wasn't sure of, and I was just deeply, deeply sad. And my hopes were becoming reduced. At that moment, Hazur 
uh, came, he came to the entrance, but instead of walking past me, he suddenly stopped and he took hold of my ha arm and he turned towards me and uh, Hazur, in a very low voice so that other people perhaps couldn't hear, explained the mistakes I'd been making, uh, but said that it gave me a renewed sense of hope. He said that I should go and seek advice from people like Asif Basit Saab, who's the director of programming within MTA. And he said by being trained in this manner, I would be able to eradicate um, the greater bulk of these weaknesses within a very short period of time. And so where I'd been completely sad and low and unable to see hope in the future, Hazur just filled me with hope. And then Hazur asked that there had been a group mulakat, a delegation that had come to see him recently. And he asked, did you attend this? And I said, no. And then the instruction came that uh, when these sorts of events happen, I should attend. And so where I'd thought that because I'd made some mistakes that maybe I would be removed from the team, instead Hazur brought me closer and involved me even further with the work for that program. I don't want to uh, dwell endlessly on the various mistakes that I made while producing this program, but I will mention one more. And the reason is that when we when we watch a football match, we often see the commentators say, or the players themselves say, that they would run through a wall for a manager, and uh, or run through a brick wall for a manager. And of course, the work of the MDM Muslim community is far more important than a mere football match. But I've often seen that the way Hazur addresses his workers and cares for his workers, he gives guidance with such wisdom that you become so motivated, you feel like you could actually run through a wall to fulfill the instructions of Hazrat Khalif al Masih. And I wish to give one example in that regard as well. When Hazur moved from the Fuzzle Mosque to Islamabad, again, I prepared, a, uh, or I was part of the team that prepared a program on that occasion. But once more, there were some shortcomings. Essentially, what it came down to was that the program didn't capture the grandeur of the occasion, the great blessing that Allah the Almighty had given in uh, bringing about this move from the Fuzzle Mosque to Islamabad. And then when it went for checking, uh, then this was the feedback that returned from Hazrat Khalif al-Masih. At that time, it was quite late on Thursday night, around Isha time, and the program was due to broadcast the following evening on Friday. So we were running out of time and the MTA team returned to work because we, we were asked to basically more or less start again from scratch. Now, normally it would take a week to produce this program and so we were under a lot of time pressure. At that moment, we received a message from Abid Khan Saab. Abid Khan Saab, some of you will know as the press secretary of Hazrat Khalif al Masih but he's also the head of the MTN News Department. And so this week with Hazur, the program comes under him. And, and he said that Hazur sent a message to the workers. He has said that on one occasion, Hazrat Muslim Aud attended the first day of Jilsa, and he saw that the arrangements were adi weren't adequate for the number of people attending Jilsa. And he expressed this. And at the time, the Sadr of Majlis Qudam al Ahmadiyya was Hazrat Mirza Nasir Ahmed. And when Hazrat Mirza Nasir Ahmed heard these words, he gathered all the Khudam who were on duty. And together, Hazrat Mirza Nasir Ahmed and those Khudam worked all night. They worked through the night. And when Hazrat Muslim Aud returned the next day, he was pleased to see that the arrangements had been brought up to the standard. And Hazur said that as wukf is in the Giz, as work is in MTA, we should remember that our that our time at work doesn't come to work come to an end at 8 p.m. But instead, our time comes to an end when the work has been completed. Now, on the one hand, we've been told that the program wasn't good enough, but look how Hazur motivated us, that he gave us so much hope at the same time that if you just work one more night on this program in the morning, I will be as pleased with you as Hazrat Muslim Aud was with Khudam al Ahmadiyya in his age on, on that occasion at Jilsa. And so with these words, Sarab Zishan Saab from production and Sayyid Wasim Saab 
and myself were there and we worked through the night till around Fajr time. And at Fajr time we took, uh, we, we, we brought the first round of the work to an end, but we returned early in the, uh, the morning and we continued the work and we continued through the day. And by the grace and blessings of Allah, we were able to complete the work in time and the program broadcast uh, at the correct hour. After it broadcast, I can say that normally for an episode of This Week with Hazur, we would take a full week to prepare the episode. But on this occasion, we prepared it overnight. Yet, we prepared it with the instructions and guidance of Hazrat Khalif al Masih. So even though it was prepared in less than 24 hours, just in one night, that program happened to be the most popular that we've ever had with the largest viewing figures we've ever had for This Week with Hazur. And it remains so to this day. So after making a number of mistakes in the early development of This Week with Hazur, I suggested to the head of my department, Abid Khan Saab, that the best thing to do would be to have, uh, if the news team could have a mulaqat directly with Hazrat Khalif al Masih and learn and understand from his guidance directly. By the grace of Allah, Hazur accepted the suggestion and invited us for a mulaqat in Islamabad with the Waqf Zindagis from MTN News. During that mulaqat, I asked Hazur, what are, your what are your expectations from the program this week with Hazur? And his answer surprised me. Hazur said, it's not about my expectations. It's about the expectations or the requirements of the MD Muslims around the world. So you should go and find out, go and speak to the MDs and find out what they think of the program and how they think it can be improved. What, it what that answer demonstrated to me was, first of all, Hazur's extreme humility, but secondly, his love for the MDs around the world and that he was saying this. It reminds me of a quote of Hazur's that he made in 2014. <laughs> Uh, one of the things I also want to talk about, and one of the things we've tried to cover on the program this week with Hazur, is Hazur's relentless schedule. Particularly when Hazur was at Fuzzle Mosque, we saw we, we produced an actual episode which covered his routine. Hazur has mentioned how he wakes up for Tahajjud before Fajr. And then in the morning, we would see Hazur would begin his office hours. And from early, early in the day, in the morning, we would see official mulakats beginning and workers of the MD Muslim community coming to receive guidance from Hazur. Then in the evening, we would see that many MD families would arrive and they would have their mulakats that as was scheduled. And apart from this, at the time I was told, and this remember this was while Hazur was still at Fuzzle Mosque, I was told by the private secretary, Munir Javed Saab, that Hazur receives 10,000 letters a week and personally gives hundreds of replies. And I've been told since that the numbers have increased actually. So Hazur was extremely busy. But one thing we also saw was that on an evening after Isha, Hazur would invite members of his ex extended family to, uh, would graciously invite them to join him for a mulaqat after Isha. Now bearing in mind that Isha takes place quite late in the summer, this could be quite late at night. And it might come to, by the time it came to an end, it might be coming close to 10 p.m. Yet we would see that at 10 p.m., the private secretary staff had either left or they would be leaving at this time. And at that moment, when the mulaqat came to an end, Hazur would return from his residence to his office and would continue his work by himself with the private secretary's office emptied. I have mentioned Hazur's exceptional schedule under normal days, so you can only begin to imagine how hard Hazur has to work during the Jilsa period. And so 
during Jalsa 2019, we saw that Hazur's meetings, apart from the five lengthy speeches he had to prepare and deliver and the bed ceremony, his meetings with delegations would last late into the night. And then there were so many delegations that required his time, it wasn't possible for him to meet them all during the Jilsa days themselves. So for perhaps around 10 days after Jilsa, Hazur would continue having meetings with Jilsa delegations and they would last for many hours each day. And on top of this, he would meet perhaps 70 or so families each day from the Amdiya Muslim community as well. Hazur was so busy that we made a decision, the MTN news team made a decision that the episode of this week with Hazur from the Jilsa week, we wouldn't send it to Hazur to check before broadcast. And the reason for this was that we thought that Hazur is so busy that it would almost be an, an, just an added burden on his time for us to expect him to give specific guidance that week. The following day after broadcast, Hazur's meetings with the delegations were continuing in his office, and it was several hours of meetings with many delegations, one after another. I happened to be filming there on camera, and Abid Khan Saab was there as his press secretary, but of course Abid Khan Saab is also the head of MTN News. So Abid Saab, in between one delegation leaving and the next delegation arrived, arriving, Abid Saab approached Hazur and said, Hazur, we broadcast the This Week with Hazur program yesterday. And Hazur said, yes, I know, I've seen, and it's okay now you've done it, but you didn't send it to me for approval. So this shows that even at such a busy time when Hazur doesn't, almost doesn't have a single moment of rest for weeks on end, Hazur is still so diligent and so determined to continue his service to the Amdiya Muslim community that he's still involved with every aspect in every department. I have mentioned Mulakats for the extended family. My son Talal, who when he was very young, perhaps around 12 months old, a year old, he developed quite a funny habit. When the Mulukat would come to an end and Hazur would be uh, leaving his residence, my son would run behind him and he would start saying, Bahar Janai, Bahar Janai, I want to go outside, I want to go outside. And because he was only learning to speak and he didn't know very many words, I think what he meant was that, Hazur, I want to see where you go when you finish this Mulukat, when you leave this door, where, where do you go to? So this happened on a few occasions, and on this third or fourth occasion, maybe, Hazur, I would always try and hold my son back and take him to the right place, but Hazur turned to him and sort of asked him to come with him. So we had this interesting scene where Hazur was walking down the stairs, and by his side, side by side, perhaps holding hands, was my son. But my son had only just learned to walk, so after four or five steps, it became clear that he was going to take a while walking down the stairs. So Hazur turned to him and motioned that he, he can join Hazur and Hazur will pick him up. And so my son readily agreed and Hazur picked him up and carried him all the way down the stairs. And then when he'd got to the bottom of the stairs, Hazur turned into his office. And at that point, I'd been following to make sure that my son would behave in the proper respectful manner. But when Hazur entered his office, I thought that it would be wrong for me to enter Hazur's office without an invitation. So I waited outside and wondered what was going on inside. And after a minute or two, whatever happened must have, uh, the tour that had happened within the office must have come to an end because the door opened once again and standing there was Hazur and in his arms was my son. But now my son was carrying a giant box of chocolates and uh, so that brought that occasion to an end. But by the grace of Allah, I would say that, and I'm sure the MT International team can testify, those who followed Hazur around the world, that there is nothing special about my son or about me. The special person is Hazrat Amir al muminin because with every child that I've seen of the Amdiya Muslim community on many, many occasions, Hazur is always ready to show very special love to the children of the Amdiya Muslim community. In Silver Spring, you had given me a Milky Way and a pen. I still have those two things. <laughs> I, uh, you met me in that Rahman? Yes. And there, you, you, I gave you something? Mm -hmm. Now come in again. Take another one. Nice. <laughs> 
Acha. You are you are more confident than your brother. Huh? And uh, that chocolate I think must have expired. Uh, so you, 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 you take this new one and this take this with right hand. Take this pen and use it now. <laughs> These mulakats for the extended family of uh, Hazur would normally last for about five or ten minutes, but there were occasions when they would uh, go on for a little bit longer. And one of these exceptions comes to mind was when Hazur's cousin, Khala Amtulhi, was very seriously ill. And in fact, she was in the final period of her life. And I'm sure and I'm aware that she was advised uh, medically advised that she should take complete rest. But such was her love for Khalafat and her desire to be near Hazrat Khalif al Masih that nonetheless she would make the journey to join these uh, mulakats after Isha. And so when Hazur would see her and her family arrive, uh, at least on one occasion, if not more, he would extend it and he would extend the mulakat to such an extent that it might last for 40 minutes or maybe even a little bit more. And I'm sure that Hazu's time, his care and attention on these occasions was an extreme source of comfort for Khalam Tulhi and her family. But even then, after such an extension, after such a long mulakat, we would see, and quite late at night, Hazu would stand. And after these lengthy mulakats, he would return to his office and continue his work for the MD Muslim community. Again, I, I, I'm sure that many people around the world in the community can testify that this isn't this care for people who are who have who might have a health condition or a health worry isn't unique to Khalam Tulhi, but in fact is something that Hazur has for the whole community, in fact the whole of humanity, and many of us can testify to it. I was once taking an interview with Atar Zubair Saab, who has had the good fortune of traveling with Hazur as part of his gafla on many tours around different countries in the world. And he told me quite an inspiring incident. In 2018, Hazur was traveling to Spain for a visit to the Jamaat there. And Atar Zabar Saab had the good fortune of joining him. But Atar Zabar Saab had had an illness for quite a while and the illness meant that whenever he traveled, he'd have a fever. And the same happened when he joined Hazur on that occasion. On the first day, he developed a fever. On the second day, the fever continued. And on the, by the third day, it was so bad that Atar Zabar Saab was unable to join the Fajr prayers. At Zohar time, Hazur saw him and asked, what happened to you? Were you unwell that you didn't join the Fajr prayers? And uh, Atar Zabar Saab explained the situation. At that point, he says that Hazur took hold of him and held him for a while. And then Hazur said that this fever has gone now. The time that I was interviewing Atar Zabar Saab was many months later, almost a year later. And he told me that since that day, even though previously he'd get this fever all the time, especially when he traveled, since that day, the fever went by the evening after Hazur said that the, fe the fever is gone now. It went and then it never came back. And even his families and loved ones and those people who know Atar Zabar Saab well and knew he had this illness and he would get this fever regularly are asking him, what's happened to your health? And he just said, would say, Hazur has prayed for me. There's also one incident of my own which I can mention, although it's certainly not uh, uh, comparable or uh, as serious, but I think um, perhaps people will find it a little bit amusing. I was once playing uh, football and uh, I hurt my hamstring a little bit. I got a little injury. And so I decided to write a letter to Hazur. Over the years, I've received a lot of advice from different people about how best to write a letter to Hazur. And one piece of advice was that you should keep it short and get to the point so as not to waste any time or waste, so not to write pages and pages. And I think that's a good piece of advice. And secondly, that some, somebody had perhaps told me that if you, handwrite a letter, then it adds a personal touch. And I think that both of these advice, pieces of advice have their place, 
but they also have their limits. And I man managed to find the limits of both these pieces of advice on this particular occasion. So having had a hamstring injury, I decided to write a letter to Hazur in which I wrote, and I had another concern as well. So I decided to mention both those concerns in the following manner, that after the basic formalities of the letter I wrote, Hazur, I have a health concern and I have a financial concern, so please pray. The following day, I received an unexpected phone call from a number I didn't recognize, and when I picked up the phone call, I asked who it was, and they introduced themselves as a member of staff at Hazur's private secretary's office, and they asked me that uh, Hazur has read your letter, and I said, which letter? Because it slipped my mind. I couldn't even remember. I said, which letter? And they said, the one in which you say you have a health and a financial concern. And I was like, oh. And they said, Hazur has asked to see you, so you'd better come in tomorrow. So the following day, I arrived at the private secretary's office and then made my way as appropriate to, when called, to Hazur's office. And as soon as I walked in, Hazur asked me, what is this health concern you have? I said, Hazur, I've got a slight strain in my hamstring. And then Hazur said, what is the financial concern you have? And I said, Hazur, I, I received a parking ticket. And then Hazur said, how much was that for, 10 pounds? And then I was a, a little bit, uh, uh, and then Hazur said, as far as your health concern goes, write to me what, what it is exactly so that I can prescribe some medicine. And as far as, as far as your financial concern goes, be more careful in where you park in future. And then Hazur had added that when you write to me, don't handwrite it anymore because nobody can read your handwriting. So please type it out in future. So then the mulakat came to an end, but something interesting happened uh, afterwards, which is first of all that the hamstring that I'd had had been causing me discomfort since the injury. And almost as soon as the mulakat came to an end, or as soon as it came to an end, I could feel that it was better. And my fellow footballers who'd had the injury before said that it would cause me discomfort for three weeks to a month. But my recovery was almost instant. And I think people even commented that how was I able to play again so soon. And the second thing that happened was that I'd had three parking tickets outside my house from the same council in the months before and I'd appealed all three of them but the first two times I hadn't written to Azur and the appeal had been rejected and on the third occasion two months passed and they hadn't replied and so I followed up with them that I appealed this parking ticket and you haven't made a decision and they sent me a letter the council sent me a letter and they said that actually we think that you were in the wrong and you deserved a parking ticket but because two months have passed legally we can't enforce it anymore and with this, in this way, the parking ticket was also dismissed. By the grace of Allah, I believe that uh, both of these outcomes were a, a blessing of having written to Hazur and having requested his prayers, alhamdulillah. I, I want to turn to a slightly more serious incident now, which is that when my wife was pregnant, she also had a health concern. And we happened to be at a mulakat with Hazrat Amir al muminin there was a group of people there, not just my wife and I, quite a few people. And Hazur looked at her face, and I think she'd been fine when we'd set off, set off for the mulakat, otherwise, of course, I wouldn't have set off. But as we'd been, it had been quite a long journey to Islamabad, and close to Islamabad, she started to feel a little bit unwell. And Hazur took a look at her face and could immediately tell and see, and he became worried. And he, asked his granddaughter to take my wife to Hazur's kitchen and serve her some medicine. But when my wife left the room, you, Hazur remained quiet and you could see on his face that he was still concerned and he wasn't satisfied with the situation. So after a few more seconds, he stood up himself and followed into the kitchen and the mulukat came to an end. And when he went to the kitchen, he took out some water and he put some sugar, sugar in it and he put some um, medicine in it. And it seems that whatever the problem was, he'd ident identified it completely correctly. 
cause, because in a few minutes my wife felt better and we were able to return home. But even then, Hazur's kindness and the kindness of his family didn't end because as we were leaving, Hazur's respected wife, Khala Subui, said to us that as soon as you reach home, you should send a message through someone that we've arrived home safely. And I think the reason perhaps was that Hazur's, Hazur and his family were so concerned and are so loving that they would remain worried and praying until they reached good news that, uh, received good news that everything was okay. Unfortunately, the, although at the time she, she felt better, perhaps some weeks later or some time later, uh, her medical concerns during the pregnancy hadn't come to an end. And it reached such a stage that my wife's condition was such that I had to take her to hospital in quite an emergency. The information reached Hazu that this was her condition and she'd had to go to hospital. And so Hazu first sent a message that she should take such and such a message, uh, medicine. But I, don't, I think this wasn't enough. Hazu's concern remained. So then he asked somebody to check if we had that medicine readily available. And we replied that we didn't have the medicine available in our house. And so this was during the Jilsa period and Hazur was extremely busy, but he also had family members from abroad who'd arrived and were staying at Islamabad for the Jilsa period. So he arranged for his nephew and niece to travel from perhaps from Islamabad to London and deliver medis medicine to our hands. They came to St. George's Hospital in Tooting and delivered medicine uh, to our hand, and this was quite late at night, perhaps around midnight. So this again was a demonstration of how much love and Hazur uh, how much care Hazur has for the MDs and their health concerns. By the grace of Allah, with Hazur's guidance, with his prayers, um, some months later, uh, she made a full recovery, and some months later, we were blessed with uh, our second child. I think one of the things that we see when we look at Hazur's character is how as Hazrat Khalif al-Masih is the fifth successor of the Promised Messiah al-Islam, he's a perfect representation of the Promised Messiah al-Islam, he's per a perfect representative for this era, he's, truly he is Khalifa al -Wakt. And these incidents that I've mentioned of his taking care of MD Muslims who might have medical concerns reminds us of the Promised Messiah al-Islam. There were people in the Promised Messiah Islam's time where the doctor said that there's no hope for them, that they will pass away and he would pray for them and show concern and love and then they would make a recovery. And then there were other people where the doctor said that this person will now lose their sight and they will become blind and the Promised Messiah Islam would pray or in some cases they would just touch the person and very soon thereafter they would make a recovery and they would be okay. So this reminds of us... Uh, 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 Hazur in this way reminds us of the Promised Messiah al-Islam, but this isn't the only way. There's a, a very well-known incident of how some enemies of the Amdiya Muslim community conspired with a magistrate in India or perhaps British India at the time against the Promised Messiah al-Islam and they made a plan through completely false allegations they would have him put in prison for quite an extended period of time. And they hurled a number of insulting comments towards him as well. And when news of this plan reached the Promised Messiah al -Islam, he said that I am the Lion of God, let them try if they will, let's see what happens. And of course, Allah the Almighty protected him and their plans came to nothing, they failed completely. But one thing that struck me is this comment, Lion of God, what does it mean? And of course, I think one of the meanings is that the Promised Messiah al -Islam was always ready to defend Islam, to defend Allah the Almighty's cause, to defend the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, regardless of the opposition, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the plans of the enemies. And this is a quality that I've also seen in Hazrat Khalif al-Masih. One example springs to mind in Germany in 2019. Hazur was in Berlin and one morning he arrived at his office and found a journalist there. And the journalist began to ask him questions and she was recording the interview and Hazur began to answer the questions. But you could see from the journalist, although she was completely polite, 
You could see that she'd done a lot of anti-Islam research and her questions seemed to have an agenda. And in fact, each of them seemed to be trying to attack Islam or test Islam's defenses from a different angle. Hazur remained completely calm and very patiently and kindly explained the answers. A lot of the questions repeatedly seemed to imply that Muslim, Muslim women, Muslim ladies are somehow mistreated in Islam. We have our women's organization. They are very active. If you have ever happened to see our convention, you would have seen women organize the functions and they are very active in the Jamaat and in our community. There are quite a number of women who are doctors, teachers, architects, and they go outside to work and or hold their meetings outside, their functions, and they have their separate setup. But why separate? That's a question yes, many, yes, many yes, people ask yes, in Germany. Because yeah. we believe that women can flourish better before without the shade of men. So if they are free, they are separate, then they are free to grow. You know, see, if you plant a small tree under a big tree, it cannot grow well. But at the same time, they have the same rights. Women have the right of divorce in Islam. Women have the right of inheritance in Islam. Women have other rights which were uh, being denied some uh, decades ago in the West. Even. So now that you have those rights, but you cannot say that you are the champion of giving these rights to the women. It is the Islam who is the champion of giving these rights to the women. So the uh, interview came to an end and Hazur had beautifully answered all the questions. But there was one interesting thing that happened at the end of the interview. Hazur began to apologize. He said, I'm so sorry. Nobody told me that this interview was going to take place. And perhaps you were waiting for some time because I wasn't aware that it was going to happen. And it seemed that the first time Hazur had become aware that the interview was scheduled in the program, it hadn't been written in the program, was when he walked into the office and found the journalist waiting for him. And I was so surprised that Hazur, it was almost like an intellectual ambush had been set up in Hazur's office. And instead of being surprised or perplexed, Hazur had so perfectly and so calmly answered all the questions and emerged completely victorious. Another example of Hazur's desire to defend Islam came uh, during the Jilsa period in last year. And as I've mentioned, Hazur was tremendously busy in those days. And there was a delegation from Spain. Now to put this into context, a week before Jilsa, there had been quite a controversy in the national media, across the national media in the UK. What had happened was that Boris Johnson, the prime minister, had appointed somebody called Preeti Patel to a very senior, senior position. And the media had made a great fuss over the fact that Preeti Patel in the past had made a number of comments in favor of the death penalty, capital punishment. And under this huge national pressure, Preeti Patel gave an interview to the BBC and spoke to a number of newspapers in which she said she completely denied her previous view views, backtracked, rejected them entirely and said, no, no, I'm not in favor of the death penalty. So when this mulakat came along with the Spanish delegation, one of the people picked up a microphone. He was a national politician in Spain. And he said that my daughter was kidnapped and murdered. In Islam, what would be the penalty be for somebody who committed those crimes? At the time he asked the question, I, was, I happened to be on camera and I felt some tension. I was wondering how Hazur will address this question in light of the fact that, of what had happened in the UK over the last week and in light of the fact that most European countries are against the death penalty. And I was also wondering how there was a large delegation here, a number of dignitaries, a number of Spanish guests. I was wondering what their reaction would be to Islam's teachings. But Hazur immediately answered that this is a heinous crime and it deserves capital punishment. With complete confidence, that was his immediate answer. It seemed that perhaps I wasn't the only person who was feeling some tension in the room because when Hazur gave his answer, 
the person who was translating from English to Spanish turned to Hazur and repeated the answer back to him quietly as though asking Hazur, is this really what you want me to say? And Hazur with complete confidence again repeated the answer and then it was translated. And then Hazur added that yes, in Islam you are allowed to forgive, but the forgiveness can only come, as in a reduction of the penalty, can only come from the family. It can't be enforced by the government or the courts on the victim's family. It's up to the victim's family to decide. When the Spanish politician heard this, he picked up the microphone and said, your answer has caused the anxiety to go from my heart because I actually got into politics after the, the crime that was committed against my daughter because I thought that the punishment was far too lenient and I've been trying to change this punishment. And it seemed to me that the tension was removed from the room. And in fact, we saw that at the end of the Molokat, large numbers of Spanish guests queued to have their photo taken with Hazur and seemed extremely impressed with Hazrat Khalif the Masih by the grace of Allah, Alhamdulillah. So when we see Hazur in this role where he so courageously, like a lion of God, defends Islam, then we think that Hazur shouldn't be by himself. He should be, we should join him, we should stand up to help him. And how can we do that? And this brings to mind one more question that somebody asked of Hazur. The questioner said that when we look at the prophecies, the various religious prophecies, we see them being fulfilled one by one. And it seems from the prophecies that we're drawing very close to perhaps one of the final prophecies, which is the victory of Islam Ahmadiyyat, in which large numbers of peop people will join Ahmadiyyat. So what is Hazur's view on this? And Hazur replied, that Allah the Almighty had promised Moses and Aaron that they would be granted the promised land. But when Allah the Almighty asked the people of Moses and Aaron, although Moses and Aaron, Islam, the prophets Hazrat Moses and Hazrat Harun were very much willing to do the work that was required, their people weren't willing to do so. And because of this, the promise was delayed for 40 years, even though it had been promised by Allah the Almighty. So Hazur said that although there is a promise of the victory of Islam Ahmadiyyat, whether it happens sooner or later depends on how hard we're willing to work. So now it's up to you on how hard you work. And when Hazur said this, it seemed to me he was in particular addressing the younger people in the room. So with I'm aware that many young people will be hearing this talk. I hope and pray that as you're being told during this at Fal Rally, during the various speeches and events, on how the expectations that Majlis at Fal al has of you, on the requirements the Jamaat has on you, that we're able to learn from those, and we're able to serve Khilafat al and understand our responsibilities. Ameen, Thumameen.